I'm Abigail DeWitt, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Abigail DeWitt. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Abigail DeWitt on the show with me. She has a phenomenal new book that is out today. Uh, Welcome to the show, Abigail. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're you're welcome. Um, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? So, so yes, I've been thinking about that question because I listened to the show and, um, I am one of those people who always knew that I wanted to be a writer. Um, my, my dad read to us all the time. My mom was a great storyteller. It was, it was just so clear that telling stories was what I wanted to do. But the most vivid memory I have of it. Uh, actually has to do with literally learning handwriting. My handwriting is terrible now, (laughs) but uh, I went to a school where they taught you cursive in the first grade, and I was so excited about forming letters, and I would just do it over and over and over again. And if I'm in a meeting now where I'm a little bored, I will start forming letters the way they teach you to do When you're first learning cursive, the way I never do anymore, and I still get the same thrill. You know, I'll write a sentence like, I see a cat, (laughs) and and I'll get that same old thrill. How cool. Uh, So there's just this this uh ingrained love of of words and language. Uh, do, Do you attribute that to your mother? Well, um, to both of them, really, uh, my mom was French and she, um, she spoke English beautifully, but with a very strong accent. And so it was just this beautiful musical voice. Um, and she told us great stories, but then my dad read to us and he really loved good writing and he was American. Um, so, so I really think it comes from both of them. Uh, um, you you mentioned that your mother was French. Uh, she was also a physicist, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Both my parents were theoretical physicists. <laughs> wow. What, what kind of effect does that have on a youngster uh, growing up with physicists in the house? <laughs> well, you know, it was really, it was interesting. Um, uh, in one way, I thought I was doing exactly what they were doing because theoretical physicists do it at a desk. So I thought they sat there writing at their desk and I sat there pretending to write at my desk. And so I thought I was doing the same thing they were doing. Um, On the other hand, they were friends with, you know, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Weinberg, all the, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, these really, you know, big, famous people. And, um, and in some ways that was, that was both interesting because, you know, people at that level can be a little odd. (laughs) Um, but also, um, it was, it could be intimidating, you know, because I knew I wanted to be a writer and there was this sense, not from my parents, but just from my own growing up around these people that, um, you either made it to that level or forget it. Right. There, there's an interesting connection uh, I've noticed, uh, and, and some people um, agree with me and some people don't, but uh, the, there, there's 
an interesting connection between uh, the sciences and uh, the arts as we think of them. Uh, I, I've noticed that a good number of writers uh, came up uh, working in, in IT or in, in some other form uh, of, uh, of science and e- even, uh, you know, uh, theoretical physicist. I, I actually have a, a couple of friends who, who are physicists and, and are uh, creative writers. And uh, there seems to be a connection to me. Uh, it, it seems like those things are diametrically opposed, but I, I think there's something about uh, trying to understand the way the world works in a in a physical sense uh, that lends itself to also uh, trying to unlock human nature. Uh, do you feel like there's a connection there? I definitely think there's a connection, um, both in terms of really seeking to understand the world um, and to have any success in science or in the arts, you have to be creative. To be able to think in new ways, you have to, you know, look at something from multiple perspectives. Um, and especially in something like theoretical physics, you never know where it's going. Um, you have no idea if the work you're doing today will have any meaningful application later on. And it's the same, you know, when you're writing a book. For me, anyway, I I never know where it's going. I never know. I mean, I, my husband has this this picture of a man on a high wire, but the man is throwing the high wire out ahead of himself. So there's not it's not attached to anything on the other end. And that's how I think of both writing and any art form and any creative endeavor. You it's you're just throwing out this high wire. And it's not attached to anything. You're just walking on it. Wow, that what a great analogy. Uh, I I really that, that's a great visual. Um, yeah. What sorts of things did you like to read uh, as a youngster? And were your parents uh, did did they provide creative stuff for you to read? Was was that what were those endeavors encouraged in your house? Very much, very much. Um, yeah, I mean they were. You know, I have a lot of writer friends who, for whom writing was essentially had to be an act of rebellion because their parents understandably said, you know, this isn't going to make any money. Um, and I never had that. And there was always tremendous support. Um, I, I really fell in love with the Little House in the Big Woods books when I was little. I was so excited to be able to read them on my own. Um but the other, the other sort of literary influence was I, my sister, um, when she was about 16 and I was about eight, and this was the late 1960s, she would play Simon and Garfunkel in the living room. And I would sit there and listen to them. And I especially loved what I refer to as Simon and Garfunkel's suicide songs, um, where the, you know, the, the character in the song goes home and puts a bullet through his head. And I was not at all depressed, but I would sit there listening to those songs, crying. I was so moved and writing poems about how my tears were like the rain or the rain was like my tears. (laughs) Really, really bad poetry. But it was, there was something about sitting there, listening to those songs, being really moved, um, that that somehow inspired me. <laughs> well, well, even then, even though the metaphor m- might m- might not be the greatest one, maybe a little trite, uh, <laughs> still you understood the power of metaphor, and uh, that's something that uh, that when it grips you, it usually grips you deeply. Yes, that no, that is true. That is true, and um, you know, and I think a lot of Simon and Garfunkel songs are really beautifully written. I think. You know, what was I'm actually musically tone deaf. So I think it really was the the power of that language that was getting to me, even though I also loved to just read the stories that the other kids my age were reading. <laughs> um, Abigail, you, you talk about um, uh, on, on your website, especially in your bio, you, you talk about uh Growing up partly in a country that won the war and partly in a country still bruised 
by the Nazi occupation and that uh, you are very interested in cultural dislocation. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, with your mother being French, uh, and, and I know that you guys traveled a lot, uh, especially in the summers, uh, was that something that was aware to you at an early age? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would say that it was. I mean, in those days, you know, when you go to France now, it's different from the United States, but not dramatically. They're both, you know, developed Western, um, you know, pretty wealthy countries. But in those days, France was really different from the United States. Um, and as I, you know, as I've said, bruised by the war, it was all anybody really talked about. And, you know, and understandably, they had had these two world wars on their soil really close together. Um, and everybody had lost family members, every single person. Uh, and there were signs everywhere saying, you know, like like on the subway, signs everywhere saying, give up your seats to the war wounded. Um and memorials to the war dead everywhere. And that was not that way at all in the United States because, you know, it was a time of great prosperity and we had won the war. And, um, you know, my life in the United States, I, I thought of, I mean, I can remember when I was little, it felt really brightly colored. You know, it was also we were in North Carolina, which, you know, a lot of sunshine. But so, you know, white sidewalks and modern buildings and swimming pools and, you know, the beginning of fast food that was so exciting. (laughs) Um, And then in France, everything was really old. Uh, There were still buildings, you know, that were in ruins sometimes. Um, people did not have very much. Um, no one I knew owned a refrigerator or a television. Uh, I still knew a lot of people who were using outhouses. It was just a real, you know, it was, um, it was a poor country because it had been starved by the war and, and the shame of the occupation, the sense of humiliation was still really heavy there for people. And so I can remember, you know, we would fly to France and, um, you always arrive early, early in the morning. So, you know, it would be sort of gray and misty out, maybe raining and the shopkeepers would be rolling up their, their, the grates that are in front of the shops. Um, very old world. You would see old people everywhere, you know, women in their kind of long black dresses and and in the states it just felt like everyone was young and things were bright and we were you know there was motown on the radio so yeah it felt really really different what was it like abigail going uh to another country for the summer and i think you mentioned you grew up in north carolina and and and, uh, i uh i I detect a hint of, of uh, Southern in your voice. Uh, and Thank you. you. You're welcome. Um, what was it like as a kid going to visit a country that was so vastly different and then coming home uh, and, you know, comparing your stories uh, with your, your classmates and your friends? Like, well, what did you do over summer? I'm, I went swimming a lot. What did you do? I went to another country. Um, did What kind of effect does that have on a kid? Uh, experiencing that, uh, but then coming home and comparing those experiences with your, uh, with your peers? Well, uh, so when I was in France, I have to, you know, go back a little bit to what it was like in France before I get, I was often homesick. Uh, you know, we were in those days, summer was three months long. So we were there for the three, full three months. And, you know, no, we were certainly not making phone calls back to the States and there was no internet and there were no, you know, iPhones. So it was really, you know, my friends and I might exchange one or two letters during the summer, but you know, kids didn't write that much. And Um, when you were there, you were there. There was no connection to the other life. Totally there. Totally there. Um, And, with relatives who did not speak English, or I had one really, really good friend in France. Um, but um, most of the time, either with relatives or with my siblings, I, you know, I have three older sisters, so I might be with them. 
um, or actually with physicists, because what allowed us to go back and forth was that my mom had created a, a summer institute for physicists in the French Alps. So she would go to run that and we would tag along. So we were also, we were in France, we were also in this physics world. Um, and, and I would be homesick, but then not when I, you know, when I would just, when I was little and I, we would get back to the States and I can always remember, you know, flying into Raleigh, Durham and then driving home and the, the, the end of the summer kind of humid, heat coming in through the car windows we'd always arrive at night and it was so wonderful you know I was so glad to be back but as I got older um I did begin to feel a little homesick for France when I was in the States and homesick for America when I was in France and I became aware of the fact that my American friends didn't have this kind of understanding of war the way people I knew in France did. And, um, and so the, there was a part of me that I was sort of always leaving behind in France. My mom's family had suffered so much in the war, and that was something that everybody in France related to and understood, and no one I knew in the States did. That, oh. that that has to be a, a very uh, formative, uh, not only affecting uh, the way you see the world and uh, the current events and past events, mm -hmm. uh, but as an artist, as a writer, I would think that that uh, lends itself to a uh, a great deal of empathy and uh, maybe uh, and you know back to metaphor we were talking about earlier uh, a. A much broader appreciation and uh, an ability to to use metaphor, maybe because you've got such a a broad palette to draw from. Well, I hope that's true. I mean, I I do feel like it was really a gift to grow up in these two cultures. I, I think, you know, you always sort of have this double perspective, and and I'm you know sometimes it was painful, um, but um, but I'm really grateful for it. Really grateful. Yeah. Uh, at what point, Abigail, did you start uh, to to really work on your writing, uh, and to the point that uh, uh, that you you've published your third novel now, News of Our Loved Ones? Uh, at what point did did the the novel call to you? Uh, so let's see. So I always wanted to be a writer, and as I mentioned, I wrote those really bad poems when I was little. Um. In high school, I wrote a few stories, and then, and also in college, I majored in English and, you know, um, took some creative writing classes, wrote some short stories. Um, really, pretty much as soon as I graduated from college, I was already working on my first novel, um, but that novel took me 10 years to write. And that's also a novel that's set in France. Um, and then by the time that novel was done, um, I was a mom and kind of busy with all of that. So there was a long period. I was teaching full time, being a mom. Things, you know, the first novel had taken 10 years. The next two novels didn't take as long, but there was a, there was a big gap in there where I didn't have much time to write. But I was always thinking about it, always thinking about it. And I'm always making up stories in my mind. And, um, you know, I'll write a short story if I don't have time to, to work on a novel. But it's always there. It's, yeah. And, and I'm, I read a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm always reading, thinking about my own work at the same time. You know, what can I learn from this? So even if it's a period of time where I don't have much time to write in my reading, I'm thinking, you know, what can I learn from this? Or I'm or I'm just getting um, excited by what I'm reading and wishing I had time to write, you know, and scribbling things in the margins. You're you're one of those uh, those people uh, that can't just 
um, lose yourself in a story. There, there's uh, there, there's always something to learn from it. Are, are you that way? Uh, I, I tend to be that way sometimes. I'm like, man, I wish I could reread that and just enjoy it this time instead of kind of geeking out over you know this sentence structure or this turn of phrase or you know something like that. Well, I would actually say that it doubles my pleasure. Ah. Now that I'm getting lost, I do get lost in the story. Um, but, you know, and a lot of books will move me to tears and, and not much. Do, I'm, I don't, I'm somebody who doesn't cry easily unless I'm reading. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm definitely getting lost in it, but I'm also having this level of excitement about the language or the character development. Um, so, yeah, I and and when I teach, I always tell my students this because, you know, initially they they are concerned that I'm going to ruin reading for them because I'm making <laughs> them analyze it. And they're like, no, you know, once at a certain point, it really just becomes fun to do this, I think. And they yeah. come to me like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why do you think it took you 10 years to write that first novel? Well, um, one, I I. I'm a slow writer. I mean, you know, the other ones haven't taken 10 years, but they, I don't churn out a book a year, you know, obviously because I only have the three. Um, I really love to, I love to write the first draft in sort of one quick kind of free writing fell swoop. But then I really love to revise and revise and edit and polish and edit and polish. I mean, that process is actually fun for me as well. Um, and the other thing for me is that I'm trying, I want to get to know my characters as well as I know myself. And it takes me a while to get to know them that well, you know, and I write many, many, many drafts. Um, and I, I feel like even in the later drafts, I'm still figuring out who these people are. Um, so, you know, I think in another life, I would like to be somebody who writes really quickly because that seems so satisfying. <laughs> but in this life, I seem to be somebody who, um, you know, who just doesn't, doesn't do it really fast. Um, I'm also somebody who cannot multitask at all. So if I'm, you know, uh, when I'm teaching full time, I'm not writing. I'm just teaching, you know. And um, when my daughter was small, that was everything. So I think that's part, you know, I think uh, people who are better at multitasking maybe can accomplish more in a life. But, you know, this is. Um, <laughs> I, I had this conversation earlier today with someone and uh, the uh, the Truman Capote uh quote came up where uh, he said something to the effect of uh, sitting at the typewriter uh, is not writing. That's just typing. Uh, the writing happens away from the typewriter. And when you're doing other things and, and when the story grows in your, in your heart and mind, uh, are, are you that kind of writer where uh, even for, for long stretches, if you may not come to the computer and, and write or revise, uh, those characters are still uh, taking form and taking root uh, in, inside of you and growing into who they'll be? I think I am, but also I am somebody who doesn't know what I think until I write it. Mm. Um, so mm. they're, they're growing in me, but I don't, I don't, for me, the writing is what happens at the table, except I do it longhand. I don't do it on the computer. Um, and that, there's something about the, you know, I mentioned before the thrill that I felt learning to form letters when I was little. And there's something for me about the brain to hand action. Something happens in there, and and I discover a lot that I didn't know before. There's uh, – the problem with me writing longhand is I can only write mysteries when I write longhand because I have no idea what I wrote. That's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's becoming a lost art form, sadly. But, uh, yeah. Um, I, Abigail, let, let's talk about the new book, News of Our Loved Ones. It's uh, it's brand new. It's out today, a uh, hardcover Kindle audiobook. However uh, you like books, you can get it in uh, in that format. Uh, tell us a, about the setup. I, I, I feel like uh, I, I already know a little bit about the uh, – 
kind of where the the germ of the story might have come from uh, it, in your experiences uh, in your youth. But uh, tell us what the what the catalyst for the story was for you. Yeah, sure. So um, I mentioned that my mom was a really great storyteller um, and that she had lost a lot of family in the war. And um, she told us she, t- you know, a lot of people who live through something like that will never talk about it. Um, but she did. She talked about the war a lot. Um, and there was one story in particular that she told over and over again that we could never get enough of. We always, my sisters and I just wanted to hear details of it over and over. And what that story was um, is that my mom and her family were living um, on the coast of Normandy. And my mother had two younger sisters And so she was, by the end of the war, she was 22. And she, actually, she became a physicist because of this. She wanted to be able to travel, and you weren't allowed to travel during the war. So she signed up for a course at the University of Paris, a physics course at the University of Paris, not because at that point she was that interested in physics, but she wanted, if you if you were signed up for a course, you could get a travel pass from the Nazis. So she signed up for the course so she could get a travel pass. And on June 4th, 1944, she left home to go to Paris to take exam, uh, for a week of exams. And her own mother really didn't want her to go because the trains were being bombed all the time. It was not safe to travel. But my mom was absolutely insistent that she was going to go and take these exams. And so that was June 4th that she left. And on June 6th, 1944, it was the D-Day invasion and her family's home was bombed. And her mother and her grandmother and one of her sisters were buried in the rubble. And she didn't know she was then stuck in Paris. There was, you know, all communication broke down between Paris and the coast of Normandy. She didn't know for a full month what had happened to her family. Um, But one of her little sisters and her stepfather had just stepped outside when the house was when the bombs started to fall. And so they survived and they dug everybody else out of the rubble. And so she heard about what had happened from them. And um, when her sister and her stepfather were digging through the rubble for the bodies, um, they only found, they found my mom's mom, they found her grandmother, but the other sister, all they ever found was an arm. And my mom would tell the story about her 16 year old sister and how all they ever found of her was an arm. And there was this beautiful picture of her in an old photo album of her sitting up in a tree, reading a book. And I was just fascinated with this aunt of mine who had died when she was 16. Um, she had been sort of the rebellious child. Um, she had gotten in trouble the summer before for writing letters to a boy. Um, She had that morning, the morning of D-Day, her grandmother had said to her, you know, have you brushed your teeth? And she said, oh, why bother? We'll probably die today anyway. Oh, my goodness. And so I was always fascinated with her. And the novel started with my trying to write about her last day from her point of view. And um, and the way I imagined it, she's actually mostly thinking about this boy she's not allowed to be in touch with anymore because, you know, she's a 16 year old girl. So that's what she's thinking about. Um, and so I wrote that story and and I felt good about that story. Um, but I realized that I was also really interested in the other survivor. Not well, she was not a survivor, but the the survivors experiences you know, what about, what about my aunt who dug through the rubble, who was 15 when she did that? What about my mom waiting for a month in Paris to get the news? Um, what about other family members? And so I, I, you know, just started writing their stories from their points of view. And it evolved into 
a novel in nine different women's voices, and they're all women telling their stories. And I realized that um, I've always loved books that are in multiple points of view. I've always felt like, and you know, this partly comes from growing up in two cultures with two really different points of view, that the truth about any situation can never be told by just one person. You know, so the more perspectives you have, the more you start to to get a sense of what really happened. And you get it not just in the way, in the things that everybody agrees on, but in the things nobody agrees on, um, in the things that one person mentions, but no one else mentions. You know, that, that the truth lies in the echoes and in the discrepancies and in the gaps between people's stories. Um so, um, and, and then, you know, I also was thinking about what it was like for me and my sisters growing up with the story of D-Day sort of as, you know, kind of how the world began on a certain level. Um, and so some of the chapters are from the point of view, not, not my point of view, but the point of view of somebody like me, somebody who grew up when I grew up um, going back and forth between the two countries. Um, so it goes, you know, it's the, the novel starts on June 6, 1944, and it ends in 2018. Uh, but it's a short novel. <laughs> I don't want to scare people off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the perfect size. It's just uh, right. Uh, so, um, so that's how it came to be. You know, it was really kind of exploring... Um, this D-Day question. But then, you know, it goes into other places, too, because, um, for example, the character who, in a sense, is based on my grandmother, but, it, you know, she's totally made up because I didn't know my grandmother. Um, her story includes things that happened in the First World War. So she's remembering back sometimes to things that happened in the First World War. Um and there's also a part of the novel, um, and this is based on real life, but again, it's all fictionalized in the novel. In real life, my mother found out when she was in her 50s that the man she had thought was her father was not her father, that her mom had had an affair. And um, so that plays into it as well. Um, Abigail, writing writing fiction is this really interesting thing in that uh, a, a lot of people think that uh, when they read a piece, a piece of fiction uh, that the that the author is just uh, very thinly veiling their own life and that and that the the protagonist is uh, is the writer and uh, and in most cases uh, that's not true at all. There there are um, little pieces of us in each of our characters and, and little pieces of truth. And, and most of the time, uh, I think the reader, uh, has a very hard time distinguishing what is real, what is not. And it's just kind of for the, for the writer to, to know those things. Um, but this book seems to be very, uh, very closely tied to a lot of your, uh, personal experiences, a lot of your family's experiences, uh, it, Yet fictionalized and, and, uh, you know, gets to play out uh, maybe in, in different ways than the reality of your family's experiences did. Um, is, is writing for you, uh, a catharsis? Uh, is, is that too heavy a thing, uh, to put on a novel? Uh, or, you know, is this, uh, just a, uh, maybe a, a fun way to play out the what ifs that, that maybe will never get answered? Oh, great question. Um, I, it's it's not really a catharsis. I write also a lot. I journal a lot, and that can be very cathartic. Um, but by the time I get to creating fiction, it's more um, – it's more fun than that, even if I'm writing something really painful, because as you say, I am playing out the what ifs. And um, I, the one other thing I would have done other than write um, is theater. 
I really, really loved doing theater when I was younger. And if I weren't so incapable of multitasking, I would have done both. But ultimately, I felt like I had to choose. And so I chose writing. Um, but I love imagining myself as other characters. I really, really love that. And so that's, that's what I do when I write fiction is I'm imagining myself as a girl who's 16 who knows that the allies may or may not be coming today. I'm imagining myself as her sister after she dies. Um, so in a funny way, you know, when all my characters are me, every single one of them, because they're all me imagining myself as this other person in these other situations. But I'm, I'm giving these characters the reactions, the, the kinds of thoughts that I myself have, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely so. Absolutely so. Um, Abigail, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a, a renewed interest uh, in the, the, uh, the reading general public, I think, in this time period, in these stories uh, that are uh, on the verge of being lost if, uh, if if someone doesn't tell these stories. Uh, I, I had a conversation um, uh, earlier uh, with uh, with Christina McMorris, and, and she was writing uh, World War II fiction, and she – this a couple of years ago, uh, she was turned down by all these agents, and, and they told her there's no market for yeah. World War II stories. And, and we just laughed about that because there's, there's such a renewed interest in it now. And, and the timing was, was just not right. Uh, but what do you think it is, uh, about, uh, the, the general public, uh, that is becoming interested in these stories again? And, and, and thank God that they are because, uh, I, I, uh, like you, uh, I, well, I had, I had some great uncles, uh, when I was a kid, uh, who, who fought in World War II, and I re- remember going to them and trying to get stories out of them, and they just wouldn't talk about it. Uh, and, and, you know, there were, there were stories around them, uh, that other family members had, had told, and we were able to piece together something. And then when they passed away, uh, I inherited a bunch of their letters and things like that, and, and, and was able to piece together things, but never, never got the story from their perspective. Uh, and, and a lot of those stories are, are leaving us now as these, uh, as the people that live through there, uh, through these things are leaving us. Uh, but what do you think it is uh, about us uh, that that really uh, is craving these kind of stories again? Well, I think you've nailed it uh, to a large degree, um, just that the people who knew these stories are dying. Um, you know, there are not very many of them left. So I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I also think that, you know, this is... Um, this is a really unsettled time globally. And um, I think people are looking back to another time that was really, you know, more than unsettled. Um, And I think people are seeing parallels and people, you know, um, are, are looking to see how we've made it through other times Um, that were even more challenging. I think, I think that's really a big part of it, but it's interesting what your, this other writer said, because, um, my first novel, um, it's not primarily about world war II, but there is a big chunk of it that, um, deals with world war II and it is set in France. And, um, I was told, I mean, I did, that one eventually did get published, but initially I was told, you know, Oh, no market for novels set in France and, you know, no one cares about world war two. We're done, you know, moving oh, on. <laughs> oh, how crazy. So, I know. So, um, so yeah, I've really noticed a huge, huge shift. I mean, there it, it's, um, the, the fashion aspect. I mean, it's not fashion is, is maybe that's not fair. It's, uh, there is a fashion aspect of, you know, what gets published, but it's also just that I think it really does resonate, uh, for a lot of people right now in terms of, of, um, anxieties that people have about the yeah. world right now. Yeah. 
And and if if fashion is uh, is the thing that prods uh, publishers to to publish more of these books, um, then then so be it. Uh, I I I don't really care how it happens. Uh, I, I'm just happy that they're out there and that and that these stories are are, are getting out to the public. Um, I I know what you mean, but uh, I you know God love them. Uh, however it gets out there, I'm I'm happy. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, I yeah. really agree. Yeah. It's and, funny. And, oh, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, um, in terms of the fashion aspect of it, um, back when I was writing my first novel, which, as I said, is set in France, um, the the most common negative reaction I got to it was that to set a novel in France was – by definition, elitist. You know, like... Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, but um, what about people who they who were just born there? You know, I mean, the, the, the assumption was you would only know France if you, you know, had the money to travel. If you had, you know, maybe done your junior year abroad or something. But I'm thinking, yeah, but actually that's true in some instances, but then there's a whole country of people who were just born there. You know? <laughs> right, right. So um, but, yeah, and that was definitely fashion. That was – Yeah. Well, and and what a, what a gift this book is uh, to the rest of us because uh, there, there's a – a very particular narrative that that we are familiar with in in stories coming uh, out of this time period and uh and you give us a, a glance uh, on multiple fronts uh with with multiple multiple perspectives uh of characters and and not only that but how uh these stories have affected other people throughout time and uh really excellently executed and uh and I, I absolutely love this book i'm recommending it uh to everyone uh so so thanks for writing it and and for bringing out uh these stories with the care that you have oh thank you so much yeah uh the book is called news of our loved ones it's out everywhere today hardcover kindle audio book um a abigail if people are just discovering you and your writing uh now for the first time is there a place online where they could find you and, and maybe dig into your back catalog and and look for news uh of maybe upcoming th things coming from you yes so my website um, has a lot of information, and that is just www.abigaildewitt.com. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I I have not mastered Twitter. It takes <laughs> all day to compose a tweet. So that's I don't think that's happening for me. Well, mastering Twitter is an oxymoron. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. Uh, I think you just throw things into the wind, and and that's that's Twitter. <laughs> But great. Uh, Instagram is, is a wonderful place to, to find books and writers. Uh, I, I love it. It's uh, you can find all the great stuff about books without getting bogged down in, in all of the the mudslinging, I think. Yes. yes. I, I uh, had never been on Instagram until my publicist for this book said you need to get an, on Instagram. And my first reaction was, oh, no, I can't deal with any more social media. But actually, I love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I love it, too. Um, I'm on Instagram as Abigail DeWitt author. Great. That's what I was going to ask you. Okay. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, the, the new book, News of Our Loved Ones, uh, it, there's a link there in the show notes at hankgarner.com. Uh, Abigail, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Hank. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. Midnight struck. The Sandman had come. A few faint notes drifted through the rooms of 417 Gorybrook. The hollow wind testing the weatherproofing. The weak scritch of the persimmon tree against Zeph's window and the drone of Hedwig's snoring. The old house shifted, creaked, and the shade of Agatha Van Brunt descended from the attic. Brahm, she called. 
the ghost paused, collecting herself on the stair. She passed a mirror, but the glass remained empty, reflecting only absence. Agatha would not have recognized herself anyway. She had been beautiful long ago, and still was in her own mind. Not a toothless and wizened specter. Not a blue chalk sketch of a hag half erased from the blackboard of night. She drifted into the master bedroom, disappeared into a shaft of moonbeams, and reappeared on the other side. She stood over Hedwig, listening to him snore. But Hedwig was not Brahm. She needed Brahm. She slipped through the floor into Zeph's bedroom. She stood over him for a long time, listening to the persimmon tree's weak coffin scratch on the window screen. Brahm? No, this was not Brahm. Not Brahm, her son. But she loved this boy. So much hidden potential. He reminded her of Dylan, her grandson. Dylan had slept in this room many, many times. But Dylan was dead, never to return. This boy, Zeph, was alive, so alive. Oh, would that he might remain so forever. Look at him. Who would consign such a handsome lad to the rot of death? Only a very cruel and blind god. Agatha brushed her spectral lips to Zeph's cheek. He stirred, scratched the spot, and rolled into his pillow. But Zeph was not Brahm. Where? Oh, Brahm is dead. She remembered now. Brahm is dead, and so are Hermanus, my husband, and Hans, my brother, and old Baltus Van Tassel, and Katrina, all dead. Only old Agatha remains, after a fashion, to trouble the world. Her sense of herself sharpened and returned to her. She searched the rooms for the crane boy. She sensed him. Yes, here was the boy, sleeping fitfully, holding his animal. She extended a hand as if to reach into Jason's chest and take his heart in her talons. The dog woke, sensing Agatha's presence, and growled. Growl till your voice cracks, cur. I could kill this child myself. I could possess the man or the boy. I could take the butcher knife from the drawer. I could stride through the night in strong male form and dissect this child at my whim. Something struck her. Something blasted her up and away from the boy. She collected her energies again and tried to re-enter but could not pass through the walls. When she found her voice, it came as hollow and cold as wind through a tomb. Who is here? Agatha whispered, and her tone might have withered grass. Show yourself. She waited with growing confusion and anxiety. She threw herself forward and battered the door like a tempest. Who is here? She cried. But no one answered. 